I am a uh, amateur professor, so I have to be careful not to uh, overindulge that part of my personality. But I would like to uh, speak a little bit about what I think is is the nature of what jazz really is. I started playing jazz in 1965, I was 23. So it's been a long time, and it's been a very interesting journey for me because. I look at jazz in a different way from a lot of other musicians I knew at the time. And I was surprised I didn't find more musicians that were similarly thoughtful about it. These gentlemen uh, understand exactly the heritage that I place myself in. There's two prominent things about jazz that I think are important distinctions about what it really is. The first thing, it's part of what happened in 20th century music in the Western world, North America and in Europe. Something happened that made jazz a real strong participant in what was going on in music in the Western world. It's as important as certain composers, the old moderns I call them, Bartok or Stravinsky or Hindemith or any of those characters. Jazz occupies a space right along with them in a pantheon of things that were really new going on in music. So it has a kind of a worldwide thing that's very important about it. And it has a local thing as far as being in American music. I do not think jazz is America's classical music. America has a very strong classical music background separate from jazz. All you have to think about is people like Charles Ives, for instance. And we could see that here's a towering figure in classical music that's pure American. Jazz is something even larger than that, or more nuanced than just America's classical music. It's kind of an easy phrase to come up with for it, but I don't think it's entirely accurate. It is distinctive in its position in relation to American art, for sure. And this was early in American history. If you think of people like Emily Dickinson, for instance, Edgar Allan Poe, Herman Melville, and then you come up to somebody like Charles Ives. And then you get up into the 20th century and you have all those other figures, especially someone like John Cage, who was like huge influence on world culture. So jazz is part of the uniqueness of American art. We have nothing to be embarrassed about as far as European art and all that stuff. We don't have an artistic culture the way Europe has, but we've got some pretty, pretty kick-ass American artists. Edgar Allan Poe, for instance, just shook the French poetry scene upside down. Baudelaire and Mallarmé, two of the significant French poets, learned English so they could read and study Edgar Allan Poe in the original language. And they both wound up making some money teaching English, but that's the reason they learned English, because Edgar Poe just rocked them when they discovered him. So we have a really strong artistic presence in the world, but we don't really have an artistic culture. American culture is really not about art. It's about a lot of other things, but the artists that have come out of America are really pretty amazing. The way I approach the whole subject of being a jazz musician is that it has something in it of both of those worlds. The strong presence in the American setting and the strong presence in the world setting as far as this is a significant new music. And I think the approach that we have as a trio really exemplifies that because it's not really dramatically stylized. We were looking for almost a kind of a neutrality of stylization. That's why I can only do a certain pieces. I can't do Oscar Peterson all night or Bobby Timmons or any of those two because that's so much language in there that I'm looking for something a little more neutral to just be able to focus and highlight the ingenuity of, of what's going on between the players.
can, I want to get these guys to comment a little bit on how do you feel you fit into that perception of what we do. <laughs> You're first. Go. Well, <laughs> playing with you brings out an aspect of creativity and a concept and approach to playing that there's not many opportunities to play this way. I think we share a love of certain musicians and the history of the music. Fair to say they would be influences, mm -hmm. but um, I'm not trying to be a clone or carbon copy of any of those things. So mm -hmm. one of those, of course, the Bill Evans Trio sure. certainly uh, is a very important group. And Bill Evans has been such a great influence on just about every piano player, even the piano players who I've played with who more lived and breathed Oscar Peterson or Herbie Hancock. Mm -hmm. You can't escape the influence of uh, Bill Evans. And mm -hmm. not, I mean, not only if you're a piano player, but mm -hmm. anyway, getting back to just uh, more specifically playing with you and Bobby in the trio, there's really uh, a lot of space to create. Roles are, I would say, less defined. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of responsibility with the space and the freedom because of the open nature of how you approach the songs. That listening is the first thing mm -hmm. and just try and hear the group all the time. We have a three-way conversation yeah. going. When it's at its best, mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. There's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of opportunity to get lost. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> which happens sometimes, which is okay too. I find it, I'm not interested in playing perfectly, and I admire players to do. If you listen to Bill Charlap, for instance, any of his live recordings, they're perfect. And I know he's worked at it. I work more on the imaginative side. I don't mind if I fluff here and there. I'd rather go way out where the experiment is and feel that energy out there and you know clam now and then is okay with me but uh, that's part of it as well looking for the vulnerability of it Finish this off with a couple of in the comments. Context, you were saying that it's not you don't you're approaching it with a really stylized language mm -hmm. in any sort of conscious way, but when you start setting up an in intro and you have your own language, that is the language when I'm mm -hmm. hearing you start to play, mm -hmm. and the atmosphere, you sort of create this ether that we all can thrive in mm -hmm. at the same time. Like Timmy was saying, it's we all have a lot of freedom within that ether, mm -hmm. but Playing with you, listening, is the most important thing. There's no conscious, rote playing going on. I heard someone say that, I think it was Stefan Harris, that the only mistake that you can really make playing jazz is when you're not listening to what your bandmates are doing or being aware of where they're at. Mm -hmm. And that's nice to say that, but when playing with you, I find that it's really at a premium. And that's what makes it so exciting all the time, and just really interesting and fun. You know? To make the magic happen, it needs the other people. I feel that's the energy of it. jazz record I have was painful to do. It was a struggle for me to do it. I managed to pull it off, but it, it was difficult because I do need that energy. But I like to do that, respect with a new player, stay back in the background enough to really let them know that there's space here. 
a lot of jazz players, to me, make a lot of noise. I like to leave that emptiness there so we can work within that. So, good. Thanks a lot for, for adding to the conversation. I thought it would be nice to have something to go along with the performance video. So, we'll go right into our music now. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. 